Amen. Well, ma'ayum gabi manghigala. You know, I'm so privileged to be able to speak to the campus ministry because, in my personal opinion, and I take a lot of pride in my own personal opinion, man. I really believe the campus ministry is the most funnest. Most all right, let me just restart there. Well, you know, basically, I'm just so privileged to be here with all of you guys to be a part of what I really believe is the most exciting, most amazing ministry to ever be a part of. You know, I've been a part of the campus ministry ever since the day that I got baptized. And I'm just so grateful that God has allowed me to be in the campus ministry for 10 whole years. And I feel even more honored tonight to be able to preach to all of you. The title that was given to me is devoted to prayer and ministry of the words. Let's go to Acts of the 6, and we'll see where we get our theme from. Acts of the 6, we can read in verse 1. All right, Acts of the 6, verse 1, the Bible says, In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. We start here the apostles' hearts. Their hearts was to not let anything distract them or take away their attention or focus to prayer and ministry of the words. But you know, when you look at the situation, it doesn't seem like that bad of a situation. It says in those days, the number of disciples was increasing. And that sounds like a great day to be in, amen? How much more so these days? But we see the apostles like we cannot let anything get in the way of our focus. And our focus must be prayer and ministry of the word. Any other focus is not right. So they put together a plan, and we see the effect of that plan in verse 7. It says, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now right here we see a slight change in the church. They went from growing increasing to now growing in increased rapidness they were rapidly increasing now i was thinking if the church was rapidly increasing surely more than just the 12 apostles were making disciples i don't know about you but i don't think 12 guys making disciples by themselves would warrant that rapid adjective right there so what happened what was the difference well what happened was the apostles made sure that the whole church was focused on the right things. The whole church, instead of being focused on racism, instead of being focused on food, they were all focused on what they all ought to be devoted to, prayer and ministry of the words. And I think tonight is going to be a night for all of us in the campus ministry to refocus. There's a lot of different things we could be focused on. We could be focused on the pandemic. We could be focused on political issues. We could be focused on our actions. We could be focused on our exams. And you know, those things are not bad. But you know what's right? Being focused and being devoted to prayer and the ministry of the word. I got to ask us, what is your focus this year? You know, I don't think any of us wants to be a part of a campus ministry that stays the same size. Right? I know that every single one of us wants to be a part of a vibrant campus ministry that is rapidly increasing, that is growing. But is that your focus as we begin this new year together? You see, every single one of us needs to get focused on what is right. Prayer and ministry of the words. But what does that look like? What does it look like when everybody is focused on these two things? Point number one. It looks like everyone is a minister. Everyone a minister. I don't know if you knew this or not, but in this new year, we are going to be having a lot more full-time ministers in the campus ministry. We're going to be having so many full-time campus ministers. In fact, we're going to have more full-time campus ministers now than ever before. And you might be wondering, well, I wonder who they're going to be. Who's going to be in the full-time ministry? 
Well, I'm glad you're asking. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And let's find out who is a part of this ministry. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll begin reading in verse 17. In case you don't know where 2 Corinthians is, it's a little after 1 Corinthians. Just want to help you out. Verse 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and I hope you are this, this evening. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's fellow co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Right here, in case you're wondering who is now in the full-time ministry, I just want you to take a look in the mirror. According to the Bible, every single one of us is in the full-time ministry. We are all a part of the ministry of reconciliation. If you desire to be in the full-time ministry, right now, that's an answer prayer. And I hope that you're fired up about this ministry, amen? You see, in the Bible, in God's eyes, every single one of us is meant to be a minister. Every single one of us is a part of the ministry of reconciliation. Every single one of us has become a new creation because Jesus Christ was willing to die and buy your messed up life to give you a new one. How do you feel about being a minister in God's kingdom? You know what's, uh, what's amazing about the word minister is it comes from the Latin word minus and i hope no one has ptsd right now about their math finals but the word minus if it wasn't obvious enough it means less and that that word later evolved to become the word that we now use as ministers servants what does it mean to be a minister in god's kingdom it means for us to become less and for god to become more is that your heart this evening? Is that your heart? Are you fully invested in the ministry that you're a part of? Are you fully invested in the church that God has died for you to be a part of? You know, the easiest way for us to know how invested we are is simply where we put the most value. When it comes to our special missions contribution, when it comes to our contribution, our weekly contribution, is that your investment of your heart as a minister of God into his church? I don't know about you guys, but this past Christmas was uh, a pretty awesome Christmas. I got a couple of things that I'd like to say I'm very grateful for, and I hope that you're all grateful for the Christmas gifts you received. But you know, I'm super grateful for my mother-in-law. She she went out and got me two new pairs of shoes. And that's hard. Let me tell you why. Because my feet are huge. Okay? Like, they're basically clown feet. I got some flippers on my legs. But, you know, I'm so fired up. I got a new pair of shoes. And the new pair of shoes that I got, I got, I got a pair of Converse. And it fires up Ariel because that's her favorite brand of shoe. Amen? And now we have matching shoes, too, because her mom got her a pair of the same Converse, amen. I wish I could show them to you now, but I I don't want to show you my feet right now. <laughs> but you know, I don't know if you guys can relate to me or not, but whenever I get a new pair of shoes, I just I just want to make sure that they stay clean. Yeah. You know what I mean? Who who hates it when you pull you wear your clean shoes, your brand new pair of shoes for the first time and then it rains? I mean, oh my god, like God does not want my shoes to stay clean. Right? When we get a new pair of shoes. We want to clean it. We care for our pair of shoes. In fact, we are mindful of it. What do I mean by that? I don't know about you guys, but when I put on a new pair of shoes, I, I'm mindful of everyone else's feet. Okay? 
I, I, I actually literally pay attention because, you know, I got some big feet, so it's super easy for people to step in my, my shoes. And my gosh, you know that I love Christ and I love the kingdom more than anything because I have to deny myself right there every time I get stepped on. But, you know, we all love shoes, amen. We love to be mindful of it. We make sure they stay pristine. We make sure that we clean it, even though it's something that we use probably for one of the dirtiest jobs in the world, which is on our dirty feet on the dirty grounds. We want to make sure it stays clean. We're invested in caring for the things that we value. Is that how we see our ministry? Is that how we see the campus ministry that we're a part of? Are we invested? Do we care for it? Are we, are we doing everything we can to make sure that it is in pristine condition, that everyone is doing well spiritually? Are we alarmed? Are we alert to the things that are happening in our ministry? The number one telling sign of that, whether you're invested or not, really comes down to whether you're giving your best or not. And I'm so proud of the Dabo Church. Although our church is 80% to 90% campus ministry, literally only six marrieds, and that's because there's three couples, amen? Literally 85% campus ministry, and another percentage keeps going up in there. But I'm so proud because we started out the year 2020 with a audacious goal when it came to our special missions contribution. An audacious goal to collect 250,000 pesos. 250,000. And even though the circumstances changed, even though people's financial situations changed, even though people changed, because they did, man. At the end of the year, we as a church, including the hearts of the campus ministry, we're able to smash our special missions contribution, giving over 100%, 282,000 pesos in special missions contribution. No one has to tell me that the campus disciples in Davao City are invested in this church. Because it's shown. Because they desire to give their best. Is that your heart? this evening? Are you fully invested in God's kingdom? Are you all about becoming less, minus a servant as a minister? Or are you trying to make yourself more? See, everyone in God's kingdom, especially in the campus ministry, is a minister. And my challenge for every single one of us this evening is to simply give your best. Give your best. As we go about the pledge drive, as we go about raising money for special missions contribution, give your best. And God will surely do the rest. You know, when everyone is devoted to prayer and ministry of the word, everyone's a minister. But point number two, everyone is a preacher. In case you didn't catch it there, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, the Bible says that Christ has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Talk about the biggest risk he's ever taken. I mean, isn't there so, more, so many more people more qualified than us to carry such a powerful message? I mean, you got the angels in heaven. You got him himself. I mean, he can literally create people out of the stones if he wanted to. And yet, he committed it to us. Do you feel honored that you carry such a powerful message? The message, literally the only message of reconciliation. How does that make you feel? <laughs> to know that you carry the words of life and death. To know that you can literally use the word of God and get directly into the hearts of people. That was awesome. I don't know about you, but that should make you very bold. Because in Proverbs chapter 28, verse one, the Bible says, though the wicked flee, though no one pursue, the righteous, or as bold as a lion. Do you feel like a lion this evening? And for the sisters, a lioness. Do you feel bold? Well, if you don't, most likely it's because you are not prepared. You're not prepared to share the message of reconciliation. And I know what that feels like. Showing up to anything unprepared. Doesn't it just take away your confidence? I mean, you show up to an exam, you totally didn't study for it because let's be honest, you're insane doing ML, YouTube, or 
Korean drama the whole night before? Don't you just feel a little scared? Don't you feel timid? Don't you just lose all of your confidence? But you see, when you're prepared, you can be full of confidence. And encouragingly enough, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, the Bible teaches that the word of God is used for us to train in righteousness so that the servants of God, the minister of God, can be prepared to do every good work. You see, what is our message of reconciliation? Well, to put it in layman's terms, it's simply our first principle of Bible studies. That's our message of reconciliation. We teach people how to seek after God. We teach people how to make the word of God their number one authority. We teach people how to become a disciple. We teach people what the kingdom of God is. We teach people where they're at spiritually and how they can be saved. We teach people what the proper motivation is. We teach people what the true church is so that they can be reconciled to God. But do you feel prepared when you show up to a Bible study? Do you, do you just go to a seeking God study with just incredible boldness, just fired up because you know you're going to flat can't convict that person to seek after God with all of their hearts because you're prepared to change their heart with the word of God. Do you feel prepared and confident when you walk into a light and darkness study, knowing that this person is going to have to break up with their significant other, knowing that this person is going to have to change from homosexuality, knowing that this person is going to have to throw away their addictions to the vices. You see, if you don't feel confident, it's because you still need to be taught the basic convictions that come from the Bible. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, we'll begin reading in verse 11. I keep wiping myself, but it seems like nothing I'm going to do is going to stop this sweat from coming. So, I hope that all of you guys can still see my radiant face past the sweat like the sweat droplets on my face right there. Come on, Zach. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 11, the Bible says right here. Well, we have much to say about this, and trust me, guys, I do, but for the sake of time, I can't. But it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers... You need someone to teach you the elementary truth of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. You know, the Bible says that solid food is for the who? And I know many of us would say for the mature. But I'm going to help you to understand a deeper level of this truth. Solid food is for those that have teeth. It's for those that have teeth. How do I know this? Well, because Eliza doesn't have any teeth. And so, of course, I'm not going to give her solid food. Are you crazy? She needs milk. She doesn't have any teeth. Well, I mean, she's starting to grow a little bit of teeth right there on the bottom. Just She got little two, like little, little peaks there, little hills of teeth. It's super cute, but I'm, I can't talk about it right now. Solid food is for, the is for those that have teeth. For those that know the word of God, the basic teachings so well. That when that person sits in their Bible study, they feel the bite of the Word of God. I'm going to ask us this evening, when you lead a seeking God study, when you lead the first principles, are you all bark and no bite? <gasps> are you all bark and no bite? The reason why is because you have not chosen to be prepared. You have not chosen to grow some teeth. I still remember my very first Bible study. I got it by accident. How did that happen? I was sitting in another Bible study and this man just, it was a light and darkness Bible study, by the way, I was sitting in and this man just all of a sudden decided to just plop himself down at our table right when we were talking about Galatians chapter 5 verse 19 to 21. And I looked at my leader. I'm like, Hey, is, is this okay? I mean, are we going to let this go on? And he's like, we're just going to keep going at the end of the Bible study. My disciple was like, dude, you need to share that guy, share your faith with that guy. See if he'll set up a Bible study. And so for me, I was like, Amen. I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do be I'm gonna be obedient. I'm gonna follow direction. I set up a Bible study. I go back to my disciple, like, he said yes, he wants to do a Bible study at this time tomorrow. He's like, Amen. Awesome. I'll be there at this time tomorrow. I'm like, oh great. I can be able to sit in another Bible study. I'll be able to learn more about how to lead the seeking God powerfully. I show up. 
he shows up the next day and my discipler was nowhere to be found. I call him up and I'm like, hey, bro, the guy is here. I am here, but where are you? I, I'm so fired up to sit in this Bible study. I'm gonna write notes so hard, the, the pen is gonna go straight through the paper. I'm so excited, but where are you? And my disciples like, bro, something has come up. I can't be there. You have to lead the Bible study. I literally just sank. I was so terrified. I had no confidence. I was totally unrighteous. I wanted to flee from that situation. But by whatever, it had to have been the Holy Spirit working through me, opening up the first principles booklet in front of him, going through the Seat and God Bible study. I asked him, at the end, if you want to see God with all your heart, you know, kind of like that, you want to, you want to do it? Just say yes or no. It's okay. He said, yes, I want to see God to God with all my heart. I'm like, oh, really? Uh, okay. Uh, well, let's talk about it again tomorrow. He's like, okay, I'm free at this time. I'm like, all right. Surely my disciple will be there this time. Next day comes around. I'm there. He's there. My disciple still didn't show up. I call him up, I'm like, bro, I'm so excited to write notes for a Bible study I have never led. Like, I'm trying to imply to him, like, I, I'm not ready, you know? He's like, bro, I'm sorry, something's come up. I can't be there. You have to lead it. I'm like, oh my gosh. So I, I stumble my way through the Word of God study. The next day, we set up another Bible study. I show up. My disciple is not there, but then my Bible study doesn't show up either. In fact, he texts me and says, you know what? We have different convictions in the Word of God. I know I'm going to study the Bible with you. And you know, to my shame, I was not sad, but I was relieved because I was not prepared. I called up my disciple and I'm like, bro, my Bible study canceled. And he's trying to encourage me. He's like, it's okay, bro. That's going to happen. You'll be able to get another Bible study. All the while, I'm feeling like crazy hot. I don't, have, I don't know how to lead the discipleship study. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but I made a decision. From that point on, to be prepared for every single Bible study, whether I sit in it or lead it, to be prepared to preach the word. Because in the kingdom of God, it's not just the evangelist that preaches the word. It's not just the full-time staff that preaches the word. It's everyone. In the kingdom of God, everyone is a preacher. I want to challenge every single one of us to make it our goal that by the pack rim in June, we have memorized every single first principles Bible study up to light and darkness. And that might sound like a lot, but really, what am I asking? Every month, you memorize one of the first principles. January is seeking God. February is the word of God. And whatever month comes after February, because I always get confused, you, 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 just, you, you memorize the discipleship study. And then so on and so forth until June, you start memorizing light and darkness. How amazing would that be? If every single person in this Zoom call tonight by the pack rim has been able to effectively and powerfully and boldly preach the first principles all the way up to light and darkness. Imagine that. By the pack rim, there'd be no question. We would be fruitful. And the reason why is because we were no longer settling for milk. We want that solid food. But in order for you to do this, you need to level up. And you need to grow some teeth. That's my challenge. Grow yourself some teeth spiritually. When somebody sits down in a seeking God Bible study, allow the word of God, because you have been preparing yourself, allow the word of God to bite them, impact them, because there is some bite along with your bark. Amen? You see, when the church is devoted, to prayer and the ministry of the word. Everyone is a minister. Everyone is a, is a preacher. Point number three, my last point, and everyone, a comforter. When everyone is devoted to prayer and the ministry of the word, everyone is a conqueror. Let's go to Romans chapter eight. Come on, Ben. Come on, Zach. Everyone a conqueror. Romans chapter eight, verse, verse 31. We'll see right here why that we are a conqueror. And I'm so grateful for all the lessons that we have learned so far on prayer. But I want us to understand that our prayer life is not just something we do every day. Our prayer life is meant to be something that we use to conquer every single day. 
And the reason why is because in Romans chapter 8 and in verse 31, this is what the Bible says. Whether you believe it or not, this is what it says. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Right here, Paul's making a statement that God is for us. He's not for anyone else. He is for us. Amen. And I pray that you believe that. But the evidence that God is for us is because he gave up his own son. He gave up his own firstborn son for us. And with that same logic, if God was willing to go that far, don't you think he would go as far as to give us all things? If he was willing to pay this high of a price, don't you think he could spare this much afterwards? That's how much God has invested in us. You see, we continue reading in verse 33. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or swords? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. And all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is how much God loves you. This is how much God loves us. And right here, this is God speaking through Paul trying to convince us this is how much he loves us just trying to convince us that literally nothing in all creation nothing can separate us from his love he is willing to give us all things because of one reason he loves us are you convinced of the love of god in your life. You see, if you're convinced of God's love, you will have impossible prayers. If you're convinced of God's love, you would not hesitate to pray impossible prayers that would move mountains. Because you would be able to go to God with confidence that I'm going to pray because I know that God loves me and he is listening to me and he desires to hear what I have to ask him. So much so, but in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, the Bible even says, so we can go to the throne room with confidence because Jesus Christ is there interceding with us. When you go down your knees in prayer, are you confident in what you're praying for? You see, our prayer life ought to be more than just a meager ritual we do every morning. It's to be more than just something we add to our life. It's to be more than just somewhere we cry out and confess our sins and we desire for strength. It's to be the number one most powerful thing in our life that makes us more than a minister, more than a preacher, and more than a conqueror because of God's love. And you know, Jesus was trying to convince his disciples of this very same fact. In Luke chapter 11, and in verse 5, after he teaches his disciples to pray, after he teaches his disciples how, he tells them and he teaches them the kind of heart they ought to have. In verse 5, it says, Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine is on a journey and has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me, the door is already locked. And my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I know what that's like. Amen. 
I totally feel paralyzed every single time Eliza's asleep. I don't want to wake her up. We're saying, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Right here. Jesus desires for every single one of us to have a shameless audacity in our prayer life. Just someone that is just willing to persistently, consistently impress upon God our request day and night, every single day. And it says, surely we will get as much as we need. But more than that, you see, Jesus tells us the heart that we ought to have. But then you go down a couple more verses and Jesus tells us the heart that God has. In verse 11. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You see, God is a good father. And he gives good gifts. Not only does he give good gifts, he desires to do so. He desires to do so. How do I know that? Because all over the Bible, all over the Bible, God is just trying to convince us of one thing. To pray with confidence. If God didn't want to give us stuff, he certainly wouldn't have told us to ask for it. If God didn't want to give us victory, he certainly would have told, he certainly would not have told us and commanded us to pray for it. If God didn't want us to be fruitful, he certainly wouldn't have told us to pray for it. You see, the reason why God is convincing us to pray is because he desires to give what we ask for. The only thing that we must have is confidence. We must pray with confidence. You know, I can I can no longer I can relate to this passage more now than ever before as a new father. And I think about Eliza, and I often think about Eliza a lot. But every time, no matter what kind of noise she makes, whether it be a sad noise, whether it be a irritated noise, whether it be a happy noise, no matter what kind of noise, whatever noise she makes, I give her my full attention. I could be downstairs in the living room and she could be all the way upstairs in the bedroom. And somehow I feel like my ears have transformed into such a manner to where I can literally hear her in the faintest sound. In the midst of all of the noise going on around me, I can still hear my daughter. And I desire to run to my daughter to see what she needs. Especially now that we've been sleep training her, she's been learning how to, to cry a lot more because I no longer go to her immediately. But that's my heart. I just want to go to my daughter. I want to meet her needs as soon as she cries out. And that's even more so God's heart. That if we were to cry out to him with confidence, knowing that he loves us, knowing that he desires to give us all things, knowing that we can enter into his throne room with confidence because Jesus intercedes, knowing that he knows how to give good gifts, if we would just have the shameless audacity, God would make us more than conquerors. God would answer our prayers. You know, Ricky last night laid out to us the prayer goals he wanted all the disciples to have. The prayer goals for Manila, the prayer goals for each campus ministry. I believe the prayer goal for the campus ministry in Manila is to grow to 120 disciples. But I got to ask us this morning, did you pray for those things? Mm. Were they on your hearts? You see, if you didn't, it's because you're still not totally convinced that God is for us. I want to challenge you to pray every single day for the church goals of your church and for the, for the prayer goals of your Bible talk and your ministry. And to make it an impress upon God, your desire to be fruitful by fasting from the one thing you decided to fast from, to be fruitful. You see, in Acts chapter, in Acts chapter 6, when the church was rapidly increasing, it's because every single one of the disciples were fighting together, working together to be fruitful, and they were devoted in prayer and the ministry of the words. They understood 
that every single one of them is a minister. Every single one of them is a preacher. And because of that, every single one of them became more than a conqueror. I pray and I hope that tonight we would all do the same to devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of word, to fight together as one man for the gospel. And I truly believe that by the pack rim, we will see the campus ministry not just increasing, but increasing rapidly. I love you, and to God be all the glory.